Welcome to Emerging Technology Horizons. I'm Mark Lewis, the Executive Director of NDIA's Emerging Technologies Institute. And with me today is Jonathan Caldwell, who is the Vice President of Business Innovation, Transformation and Enterprise Excellence for Lockheed Martin Space Business Area. Uh, in, in this capacity, Jonathan's responsible for ensuring that business is effectively governing utilizing data as a strategic asset. So that means helping guide new capabilities that includes uh, 5G in the application of artificial intelligence overall digital and business transformation. Uh, before this, uh, Jonathan served as the Vice President of Navigation Systems for Military Space at Lockheed Martin. He was responsible for the company's advanced position, navigation, and timing mission solutions, and that included uh, Global Positioning System, GPS-3, and the GPS-3 follow-on satellites. Um, and and pairing, pairing the mission-focused experience that he had with GPS and, and navigation, uh, with emerging technologies, including digital digital uh, 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 technologies. Um, so Jonathan is, is one of the people at Lockheed Martin who is actively shaping their future landscape. So, so Jonathan, thank you so much for, for joining me for, for, for this broadcast. No, it's my pleasure, Mark. Thank you for having me. So, so I think, as you know, um, we, we stood up the Emerging Technologies Institute at NDIA to explore the various emerging technologies, but also talk about some of the obstacles, as well as some of the, the new capabilities that will allow us to deliver um, emerging technologies, get things into the hands of the warfighter uh, more quickly, uh, more effectively. And one area that I, I know you've worked in very extensively has been the area of, of digital twins. And, and so I, I guess if I if it's sort of, there are a lot of different definitions of, of what's meant by the, the concept of a digital twin. And could, could you tell me how you think about it, how Lockheed Martin thinks about it, and, and how it's helping to shape your, your overall digital engineering approach? You know, it's a it's a great point. I tend to think of digital twin as actually a spectrum of technologies. It's everything from how you visualize data around a particular element or a piece of a mission out to the very end where you're experiencing multiple systems interacting with, with each other in a, a digital realm that represents the real physical reality that you'd be operating in. Your digital earth, your digital moon, that cislunar space, all with the right physics and dynamics to let your, your digital space and ground systems and your mission platforms exchange data and perform their mission in that real environment. And between those bookends, you have a variety of developing technologies. So, you know, from time to time, I've had people approach me and say, so is this, digi this constructing a digital twin, is it just a natural evolution of, you know, CAD CAM systems, and, and, and frankly, in my mind, I, I, I think it, it's much more than that. Cor correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but, but isn't, isn't it much more than just simply more advanced CAD CAM engineering? Yeah, I think you're totally right. CAD CAM is like one element, like one Lego brick, if you will, in what could be a, you know, that amazing end vision. The, the systems we're building today have to operate um, at human speed and in future arenas, we're gonna have to operate at much faster than human speed. Today we operate with, you know, tens to hundreds to thousands of data elements that make up our systems. In the future, we're already seeing elements in the billions of data elements being understood and manipulated at any given time. And if you think about what the future could look like with thousands and thousands of systems all interacting, whether it's in a in a space-based economy or whether it's in a conflict situation, all that data has to get processed to yield the right outcome. And uh, Digital Twin is the space where we're gonna learn. We're gonna learn for ourselves. It's where we're gonna have the opportunity to understand what the data means. And we're gonna have the opportunity to develop these algorithms, this machine learning and artificial intelligence that we talk a lot about, which will help us accomplish our missions at faster than human speeds. Right. So, so what role do you see that suppliers will play in the adoption of digital twins uh, by the Department of Defense or maybe other parts of the government? Is, is it something that, that, that you're, you're advancing for the department? Are you leading? Are you following? Are you doing both? Yeah, I think we're trying to take a real position of, of leadership in the industry. Earlier this year, through AIAA, we were able to host uh, a forum to bring together universities and other companies in the industry to talk about what does it really mean. You, you pointed out yourself that digital twin can be kind of a soft catchphrase, right? We've worked to develop 
what we think is a great maturity model for how to understand digital twins the same way we understand all of our other technologies. Everything from cybersecurity uh, to technology development, we need a language and a framework to do that. I think Lockheed Martin is taking a leadership role in defining what that framework is. At the end of the day, all of our systems are really complicated. As, a, as an industrial base, we're gonna have to learn how to find that ecosystem where all of these bits and pieces can come together because none of us are doing womb to tomb on these mission systems. We all rely on each other. We take the best parts of industry and we put them together into the systems that come together to serve this nation and our allies. So we did, we did a recent um, workshop here at the Emerging Technologies Institute on what we call the, the modernization quandary, the, the issue of you know, how do you introduce new emerging technologies when you have all these constraints, including budget constraints and process constraints. And, and we started with a technology panel, and, and one of the areas that they identified to help introduce emerging technologies was the use of digital twin concepts. Um, is, is it something that, that can have an impact on acquisition? Can it speed up acquisition? Can it reduce the cost of acquisition? Where, where do you see the promise? Um, so if you think about it, one of the key elements of acquisition is can you really understand that you're getting what you need, you're getting it on cost, you're getting it on schedule, and it really is going to do what it was intended to right. do. In the past, that took a lot of human effort, right? A lot of Everything from engineers and consultants, all looking at the analysis, the data, the design, how it integrates as a system, and convincing ourselves that it will really do what we want it to do at the, at the moment of need. And along with that in the acquisition system is that idea of, am I going to get this on time? You know, am I really going to meet my commitments to the, to the people of the nation who are expending their, their hard-earned tax dollars? to acquire these systems. All of those things boil down to data problems. So whether you're performing a digital twin of that acquisition system to understand with certainty that you're gonna get what you ordered on the time and that you can cut out some of that, kind of that middle layer um, that was there for assurance in the past, but we can get that assurance in a different way now and that we can understand the products we build and that they'll do what we ask them to do. If we can do that faster, then that just, it's all for the good. And I think that's where so, things are headed. You know, I, I think about it from the standpoint as, a, as, as, a, as, as an aerospace engineer, I started life as a wind tunnel guy. And, and of course, you know, we've seen this dramatic uh, evolution and, and, and really a revolution in our ability to do computational simulations to, to solve problems that we previously can only solve experimentally. And, you know, I think back to when I was a graduate student, there was a thought that computational fluid dynamics would eliminate the need for wind tunnels. And now we look back at that and realize, oh, that was hopelessly naive. What it did is it changed the way we use wind tunnels. It maybe it, it, it modified the sorts of experiments we did in wind tunnels, but we always needed that data to anchor them. Is it, is it safe to say that digital, that digital twin technology will reduce, and say, the number of experiments, the number of demonstrations, but it won't eliminate them? It will just change the ones that we do? Or is that a, 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 is that a naive way to, to look at it? No, I think that's a perfectly reasonable way to look at it. At the end of the day, you do have basic physics. You know, there's real science, there's real chemistry that goes into understanding the world, you know, the systems we're building. But the question is, can we go faster? Is, is it all going to be time bound by the pace at which we can do that science? Or can we get ahead of the curve? Can we extrapolate from the knowledge we have uh, and, and give ourselves that ability to accelerate much faster into that future. Um, but we're still going to be doing the basic learning, right? There's so much we don't know about the world we know. There's right. so much that we need to do in the future, right? The yeah. things that we're talking yeah. about seem like science fiction, but the fact is that the things we're doing today were science fiction to generations prior to us. So. Yeah, no, exactly right. Exactly right. So I know, if I'm not mistaken, you released uh, what I think you called the Digital Twin Maturity Model. And I'm wondering, can you tell us about that? What, what, what's involved with that model and, and, and how, how will it be utilized? Yeah. One of the gaps that we feel like exists in this discussion of digital twins is a framework, a lexicon, to be able to have a, a conversation, whether it's with our customers uh, in the government or on the commercial side in NASA 
or with our peers in the defense industrial base. We all, words matter, but in an area where you're kind of at the leading edge, words really haven't been defined. So this was our attempt to help bring some definitions, some understanding, some anchor points. Whether you're starting at that front end, like I said, that visualizing data, or whether you're working into the maturity of, do I understand the physics of the environment that I'm gonna be operating in? How do I bring models together so that we have an open architecture system for digital twins? How are we gonna define that ecosystem where those twins run? Uh, and then how are we gonna use twins, not just for like a, say a gyroscope or a CubeSat, how are we gonna use them for a swarm of CubeSats? Right. And then how are we gonna use them for a swarm of CubeSats that has to send data back to a warfighter? What does that entire data chain look like? And so that digital twin maturity model is an attempt to put anchor points along the way so that we know where we're at in the journey towards that kind of audacious far so goal. So do you view that as something specific to Lockheed Martin or something that that other other uh, you know participants down the supply chain would be adopting or is it viewed as an industry-wide uh, model? It's our goal to drive towards an industry-wide model. We feel like we're starting the conversation. We want to foster it because we, in order to be successful, you need that that common framework. You need some common lexicon. You know, our desire is to drive this open architecture, drive the standard, so that we can go as fast as we need to go. Very good. One one of the things I will tell you, I noticed when you know I was in the Pentagon um, in the early days of the the COVID. Uh, pandemic and was involved in some of the industrial base council decisions looking at the the defense supply chain and i, I I'll, I'll tip my hat to lockheed martin i i noticed it as, as a as a company um overall you had a, trim, a really really good site picture of the of the company the other companies that you work with including you know at all levels of of the supply chain all the all the tiers of supply chain and so when when we went when we would ask lockheed you know what are the impacts of covid on x um, your, 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 your Lockheed Martin could tell us, you know, with, with relatively uh, high precision, um, um, what, 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 what role each of the players had. And so, so I'm, 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 you know, delighted to see that you're thinking beyond Lockheed Martin, but thinking, thinking through other layers of the, of the supply chain. Yeah. This is going to take us all together, right? I mean, we're talking about a challenge, uh, a challenge for our time. And so, uh, we feel that, uh, we have a tremendous role to play in leading industry down that that uh, road where we can work at the speed we need yeah, to work. Yeah, I, I said I, I even I even saw Lockheed Martin sending you know basically propping up some of the companies in the supply chain because they they understood that it was important for the, for the nation, frankly. Um, but so with that in mind, you 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 mentioned something a, a, a few moments ago that I wanted to kind of circle back to, which is the 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 digital twins and, and the customer process. You mentioned NASA. You mentioned the department. So, how how do you integrate the digital twins into, say, the customer review process? Could you could you talk us through that? Yeah, let's. Uh, I can point to a couple of examples, but probably one of the most recent examples. Um, uh, take the GPS three F critical design review. Uh, in that case, right, we have a follow on system, building in. Uh, rapid analysis of the design, getting getting the government's uh, engineers together with Lockheed engineers, not just to look at pieces of paper and the outcome of analysis, but to get inside the analytical tools in a collaborative way together to engage with the data and talk about how the system would really work. Is it going to do what it's intended to do? And for some, that means looking at how how is the system going to deploy? Where are all the antennas going to live? What are they gonna look like when they get out into space? For some folks, it's how do you how do you envision those antenna patterns? How do you know what they're gonna look like? Now we're all trained engineers, right, Mark? I think yeah. you like I we mostly grew up, you look at kind of either lots of numbers on a piece of paper, and we're really well trained to visualize what that might look like, and it takes time and energy. But if you can skip that step and move straight to presenting the visual data, people 
get into the data, they begin to process the implications. What does it mean for the system? What do we need to fine tune? And we take out that layer of time uh, that we would have spent understanding and visualizing in our minds, and we free up more people to come and engage with the data. Now that design review went tremendously successful because of that ability to dynamically engage with the data in a visual way to be able to plug that system into the larger uh, PNT ecosystem and say, does it meet requirements? Uh, and that was it was and a I'll, great review. I thought it was really well. And, and I'll, I'll bet it also makes it easier for you to do trades when your customer says, hey, we'd like to do X instead of X instead of Y or, or X prime. Uh, you can do those trades very effectively. Yeah, you got it, Mark. It's all about the rapid conversations and iterations around the data. So, very good. So, so I don't want to spend the whole time only talking about digital twins because I know you're involved in so many other exciting things at Lockheed Martin. So, could you talk to us about you know some of the other innovations that your your team has been pursuing? What's 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 the most exciting thing other other than than the digital <laughs> digital twin revolution that that you've got on your plate right now? You know, I think the digital twin revolution leads into some of the hot topics. Right, we've really made a lot of headway in the in the realm of machine learning algorithms and how you apply those to programs uh, like Orion. Um, today, you know, we've got a strong partnership with NEC North America, building machine learning algorithms to understand how that Orion space capsule, how can we know that it's, that it's safe, that it's doing its intended mission? Again, right, it's, it, this is a, a deep space mission. Uh, the, the future of human space flight that's a lot of data to process. Yeah, it's right, a lot of assurance right. that we want to bring to our customers, right? Right. Mission assurance can be people pouring over reams and reams of data again, the old school way, like you know I used to do, right? Yeah. Yeah. But if yeah. we can move that into these machine learning algorithms, we're freeing up the human creativity. We're freeing up the expertise of the engineers to solve the hard problems on how to integrate Orion with the rest uh, of that deep space. Uh, the other deep space elements that are going to exist in that ecosystem. If I think back about what, what we're doing terrestrially, yeah. um, it's an exciting time. We talk a lot about a ubiquitous communication being the way we connect the warfighter. Um, you know, 5G.mil is really an idea that Lockheed Martin has around ubiquitous connectivity. How do we get those technologies proven out? How do we demonstrate them? Uh, and here uh, within space, we're one of the groups that takes those early technologies that have lots of <laughs> have lots of opportunity, and we take and we make them real by by going and peeling back the layers and finding out what's under the covers, what really makes 5G 5G, and how do we apply it to this problem of ubiquitous connectivity? Hey, Mark, yeah. you know what? It's it's kind of a funny interlude, yeah. right? We live in a very environmentally conscious yeah. world. And I have to laugh, we talk so much about how does space make kind of Earth better? You know, how do we get these ideas of power savings? It's funny that, uh, I'm, you know, I'm sitting here in this uh, room here at Space Symposium and technologies like lights shutting off to save yeah. electricity are just embedded into the fabric of what yeah. we do. And that's kind of where, you know, that's kind of where my team wants to see space go. It's how do we take the technologies and pull them out of the everyday commercial uh, telecommunications or fourth industrial revolution sphere, push them into the missions of space, because then the missions of space are gonna help what we have right. here on Earth. And I see it as this, it's this circle of connection, right? It's the circle of, a virtual circle of innovation that you know, it's going to drive us into the future. And that's one of the things that excites me about what this no, that team That sounds does. great. I mean, I, I, I can think of, you know, my own examples where, for example, military technology, space technologies now have become part of everyday life. GPS, GPS is, you know, the, the, the poster child for that. Um, you know, you mentioned satellite communications. Uh, weather forecasting is something that we, we just we just automatically expect. There's there was the old, the old joke. I think I think it's somewhat apocryphal, but the government official was asking why the government was spending money on a new weather satellite. He said we can just go to weather.com. Like, well, <laughs> where do you think it comes from? Um, 
you know, I suspect the, the, the average user of GPS doesn't even realize where, where GPS comes from or, or the fact that it's the Department of Defense that's manning that, that system for them. So, so I, I truly, uh, I, I very much, very much agree with you. Um, yeah, I'd like to, if I can, you, you talked about 5G.mil, and of course that 5G is, is, is one of the uh, uh, emerging technology priorities for the department. It's one of the things that was cited in the National Defense Strategy from 2018. Um, the Department of Defense has had a big, big push in 5G, including doing, you know, demonstration programs. Um, when I when I was in the the office of the Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, that was that was one of our biggest initiatives. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, 5G specifically for defense for the battlefield. What's what's your vision about the sorts of capabilities it, it might enable? It's really about ubiquitous connectivity. It's about how to get the right user, the right data at the right time to complete their mission. And for there to be no barriers in the ability to find the right user with the right data. You know, part of my role is to build up, how do we work uh, on the intelligent factory side, right? It's all about getting the right piece of engineering data to the right machine at the right time to be printed or milled so we can go and build the systems. Those That same need to connect users to data or production to data exists out in the in the world of the warfighter and in the world of the warfighter you know sometimes they don't need the right. results of a giant ai algorithm they don't need a complex set of directions all they need to know is the next thing right. they need to do is not go over that hill or right. you need to know what you're getting into going over that hill and they need to know it in a timely manner and they can't wait for someone to process a bunch of imagery or a bunch of RF back at a data center to think about it for 12 hours, to let a, a chain of command know about something, to then turn around and go and put it in the field. You know, we're pushing into the realm where people need to know something today. They may need to know it in an hour. And that piece right, of data right. might not be relevant if you wait for two hours. But how can we solve that problem of connecting them? Right. I, I once had an army general explain to me, it. he doesn't need to read the license plate on the tank. He just needs to know that there's a tank. It sounds like you're, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And given, you know, 5G with, you know, reduced latency, the, the, the volume of data that it can move, I mean, you know, clearly we, 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 we saw applications, uh, in, including training and, and simulation, um, but also direct applications field. Do you, do you think there's hope for being able to operate in hostile 5G environments? I think so. I, I, I probably won't speak too much to some of the technologies, but I think the idea that you can use all the bandwidth in the right way um, uh, to get your message sent to the right person at the right time. You have to be thoughtful, um, but you have to understand the underlying technologies. You have to understand why why it works, right? We, as, as uh, as consumers, we just kind of take it for granted. We kind of assume that you can pick up your phone and that it will work every time. It, it's amazing the work that has gone into the underlying infrastructure on how messages get routing, how traffic gets packetized, where it goes, um, and it's all seamless to us. We need to work on that under the covers, um, standardization, the technologies. We need to come together as, come together as industry to make it as seamless for the warfighter as it is for us as consumers. Right. Absolutely, I agree. Um, it's 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 a a great vision going forward for well for defense and for frankly other aspects of our lives. But but um, I I uh, really appreciate your perspectives on that. Um, but Jonathan, we're 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 coming to the the the, the end of our of our allotted time. Uh, so let me let me first thank you for joining us on this episode. Uh, absolutely fascinating is that I think one of the great revolutions that, that we're, we're seeing in, in the Department of Defense is, is the introduction of digital twin capabilities and technologies. And it, it does, I believe, have tremendous hope for, for, uh, for making acquisition more efficient, uh, expediting acquisition, but also reducing our costs and improving our flexibility for, for future systems. But, but also, thank you for what you do. Thank you for your role at Lockheed Martin supporting national defense. It's it's a very very important uh, function. Our, our our nation obviously depends on it. So so thank you again for joining us. No, thank you, thank you to NDIA, thank you to the Emerging Technologies Institute, 
Mark, thank you for taking the time. These are important discussions and um, I just so enjoy the conversation. Thanks a lot.